what is this weird diagnosis? And why don't we hear about PIE or pulmonary interstitial emphysema anywhere else in medicine? We know that the younger, smaller, sicker babies get it, and it's bad. But the question is, how can we avoid PIE? And if babies do have PIE, how can we support them so that it doesn't make their lungs or their PIE even worse? If you're not sure about the answers to these questions, then stick with us. And by the end of this video, you'll have a really good grasp on pulmonary interstitial emphysema. Hello, I'm Dr. Tala, and I've been a neonatologist for 17 years now, and I love everything about neonatal education. One of our channel members actually suggested this topic for us. So if you want that sort of power, then think about joining our channel membership. Let's begin. One, what is PIE? Well, PIE is a rare but bad type of lung pathophysiology that mostly affects preterm babies. It is actually one of the types of the air leak syndrome. You've all heard that term before. It basically means that air has left the space where it's supposed to be, so basically in the tracheobronchial tree, and it has leaked out to an area where it's not supposed to be. So for example, a pneumothorax is a type of an air leak syndrome. The air has left the alveolus through like a rupture in the lungs, and it is now collecting in the space between the chest wall and the lungs. In a pneumomediastinum, the air has left the alveolus through a rupture again and is now collecting in the mediastinal space. You can also have a pneumopericardium, where basically the air is collecting around the heart, or a pneumoperitoneum, where air is collecting in the belly area, or you could even have like a subcutaneous emphysema, where air is literally collecting in the skin. PIE is another type of an air leak syndrome, but this time the air has leaked from the alveolus into the pulmonary interstitium, so basically into the walls of the alveolus. This is really bad because it disrupts the architecture of the alveolus, so obviously it doesn't work as well, but also it can predispose the babies to get other air leaks, so for example, a pneumothorax. We really don't like it when we see PIE on an x-ray because it means that the baby at baseline has bad lungs and they've also just become a lot worse. So when we see it, we have to do everything that we can to try to manage these babies as gently as possible. In the NICU, it's average that about 2 to 3% of babies will end up with PIE, which is just a silly number because it really depends on the types of babies that you have in the NICU. Obviously, the smaller the baby, the higher the chance of the baby getting PIE. One study suggested that in babies under 800 grams, up to 42% of babies can end up with PIE, which seems like a very massive number compared to what we've all seen. Generally, if a baby is going to get PIE, they'll generally get it in the first one to two weeks of life, just like the other air leak syndromes. But the earlier the baby gets the PIE, the worse the prognosis it is for the baby. Two, what are the risk factors for PIE? Okay, before we go on, I want you to just pause this video for a second, or not, and think about three risk factors for really any air leak syndrome. Think hard. Okay, I'm guessing that you were able to come up with risk factors because there are many of the same risk factors for like all the three letter diseases in the NICU. So the big ones are prematurity, low birth weight, and bad or sick lungs for whatever reason. Because by definition, if a baby did have bad or sick lungs, then they needed higher pressures to be able to support that baby in the first place. Maternal PIH, HELP syndrome, and a higher exposure to magnesium have also been linked to an increased risk of PIE in little babies. Generally, babies that get PIE are on positive pressure, and usually it's positive pressure ventilation. So sometimes they can get PIE just being on CPAP, but a lot of the times they're actually intubated, whether they're on the jet or conventional ventilation. On positive pressure ventilation, being on higher pressures, as you can imagine, is going to increase the chance of developing PIE, because if the alveoli are exposed to higher pressure, they're more likely to rupture and that air to escape into the alveolar wall. The risk of PIE therefore goes up with a higher PIP, with higher tidal volumes, which kind of cause increased distension at the level of the alveoli, 
also with an increased eye time or inspiratory time. Remember, on the conventional vent, going up on the eye time increases the overall pressure that the lungs are exposed to because it means that you're spending a longer amount of time in pit. Increasing the eye time on the jet basically increases the tidal volume. So again, may cause over distension at the level of the alveoli. Generally though, if the baby's lungs are stiffer and sicker in the first place, then by definition, the baby is going to need higher pressures and generally more support, just trying to get that baby to oxygenate and ventilate. So if the baby has worse RDS, then they are at increased risk of actually developing PIE. Older babies can also get PIE, but you can imagine that that's going to happen when the lungs are really sick and need high pressures to oxygenate and ventilate. So for example, a baby with a really bad pneumonia or meconium aspiration syndrome or a pulmonary hyperplasia, all of these that need a lot of support for the baby to actually breathe. Rarely, PIE can also occur in adults. For example, a adult with really bad asthma that has been exposed to a lot of barotrauma. So yes, PIE is mostly in premature babies, but very occasionally it's seen in an older population that have been exposed to a lot of positive pressure ventilation. Three, what causes PIE? Well, we've already kind of said this, but basically, PIE happens when the respiratory and the terminal bronchioles, as well as the alveoli, are over distended and the alveolar ducts rupture so air can get into the walls between the alveoli or the alveoli interstitium. And that air can pretty much track anywhere along the blood and lymphatic vessels, even into like the pleural connective tissue. Obviously, that alveoli is not going to work well if there's loads of gas in its wall. So automatically, you're not going to have good gas exchange in the alveoli that actually have gas in its walls. But on top of that, what ends up happening is the areas of the lungs with a PIE will start slowly impinging on the functional areas of the lungs just because of the overall increased pressure. So you're also affecting the areas of the lungs that don't have PIE and affecting the overall pulmonary blood flow. But there's more bad news. That extra air in the alveolar walls, as it's healing, as the body's slowly getting rid of it, it will cause a lot of inf inflammation and also fibrotic damage. So even as the baby's healing out of PIE, there's an increased risk of having swelling and scarring in those alveoli just because the baby had PIE at one point early on in its life. Four, how do we diagnose PIE? Well, like we said, a lot of it depends on the history. So, for example, if you have a term baby with maybe a little bit of TTN that ends up breathing faster and you end up putting on CPAP, don't be the person in the unit that suggests that baby may have PIE. But if it's a four-day-old X23 weaker who's already on the jet and whose FiO2 suddenly goes up a lot higher, then yes, that baby is a lot more likely to actually have PIE. Maybe on physical exam, the baby is breathing a lot harder, so increased retractions and some tachypnea. Maybe when you listen to the baby's lungs, there's decreased breath sounds where the PIE is, is at its worst. If you get a gas, maybe there is increased hypercarbia, so an increased respiratory acidosis, and obviously you're going to end up seeing an increased FiO2 need. But ultimately, we're diagnosing PIE on x-rays, on AP front back x-rays. And in a case where you suddenly have increased FiO2 or sudden increased work of breathing, you should be getting an x-ray anyway to make sure that nothing else is going on, that the tube isn't dislodged or you really don't have a massive pneumothorax. But basically, PIE is diagnosed on x-rays. What you'll see on an x-ray with PIE is lots of little bubbly lucencies in the lungs. This has also been called the soap bubble appearance. It's almost kind of like the pneumatosis that we see in neck, but obviously this is in the lungs. So within the actual lung parenchyma, you'll see little cystic or even linear lucencies that are basically all like just a few millimeters in length. You're not going to see some massive cyst in the lungs. That's something completely different. These are all just very tiny soap bubbles in the lungs, not really soap. 
PIE can be localized, so it's just kind of in one area, or it can be diffusely all over the lungs. Obviously, it can also be unilateral or bilateral in the lungs. As those areas of PIE are kind of pushing over on the lungs and the heart, you may actually see hyperexpansion of the lungs and relatively a kind of more squashed heart on the x-rays. Lots of other things can look like PIE on an x-ray. For example, you could have pulmonary edema or aspiration. So it's important to actually rule out whether this is PIE or not. Like we already said, you can also have areas of like big cysts in the lungs, which are not PIE. For example, a CPAM or a congenital emphysema or something like that. Very different from a PIE. Also realize that by the time we're actually seeing PIE on an x-ray, it's already pretty extensive. So studies have shown that PIE has been found on autopsy, on like pathological specimens, even though it hadn't been seen on x-rays. Same thing is true of CT scans. A CT scan can pick up a PIE before an x-ray. Obviously, we're not going to be carting down these little babies to get a CT scan, so that's not really a good option for diagnosis. Five, how do we manage and treat PIE? Well, I'm sure that you can all see what the big issue is here. And that is that generally the babies that end up getting PIE are the ones that were already needing a lot of pressure and a lot of support on the positive pressure ventilation. And now they have PIE, which often means that they need even more support because their lungs are even worse. But we know that giving them more support is going to make their lungs even worse. So how do we oxygenate and ventilate babies and get them through this? Even before we get to treatment, the ideal scenario is to prevent a baby from getting PIE in the first place. So how do we prevent PIE? Well, giving maternal steroids, prenatal steroids decreases PIE. Also giving the baby surfactant decreases PIE. And you can imagine how both of those would help. If the baby's got steroids as well as surfactant, then they're going to need lower pressures to support them. Also, the baby is just being on overall lower pressures. So wean those babies if you can, whether they are on the JET or conventional ventilator or NIPPV or CPAP, wean as you can. If PIE does develop, then ultimately what we're trying to do is to allow the alveoli to kind of collapse a little bit so that the epithelial cells can come in contact with each other and actually heal. So on the jet, what we would do is to lower the peep as well as to lower the rate on the jet. As the rate goes down on the jet, relatively, the time for expiration goes up. So if the baby has more time to kind of breathe out, then there's less likely that you're going to end up with gas trapping within the alveoli. So more likely that those alveoli can then collapse. If you have a baby on a higher rate, whether it's 360 or 420 or whatever, then generally we'll take the rate down to about 300 on the jet. If you're already on 300, you can go even lower than that, 280, 260, sometimes even 240 to get that rate down as, as low as possible to protect those alveoli. Maybe I'm a little biased, but basically when we see PIE in the unit, the babies are either already on the jet or we do put them on the jet. And there have been some studies that have shown, maybe done a long time ago, that have shown that the babies that are put on a jet have a faster resolution of their PIE as compared to conventional mechanical ventilation. But whatever mechanical ventilation that you're on, make sure that you can decrease the pressures as much as possible and also make sure that you can minimize gas trapping by ensuring that the baby has enough time for expiration, just like we were talking about on the jet. And just because we're trying to do everything to be as gentle as possible for these babies, we'll often accept a higher FiO2 and slightly higher CO2. So we'll accept some hypercarbia just so that we don't have to give these babies as aggressive support while they do have PIE. If the baby develops a pneumothorax, then obviously you're going to have to treat that. So whether you needle the baby or put in a chest tube to get rid of that, again, so that you can go down on the pressures and everything on the lungs. Another trick that's shown to be helpful if a baby has PIE unilaterally, so only on one side, and that is to put the baby in a decubitus position. So basically put the baby on the lung down on the side with a PIE.
So what that will do is it will allow the good lung to open up more and therefore hopefully can be oxygenated and ventilated with lower pressure. So it will give time for the PIE to heal as you're fully breathing or mostly breathing with the other lung. So put the side with the PIE down. Others have suggested that selectively intubating one side of the lung, so basically you're just pushing the endotracheal tube down so that it ends up in one of the bronchi, not like exactly where you want it to be above the carina, but selectively intubating one side of the lungs can also help the PIE heal and rest. So obviously in this situation, you want to selectively intubate the side of the lungs that does not have PIE so that the side with the PIE can rest. I'm sure you've already realized this, but this is going to be a lot easier if the good, the healthy side is the right side of the lungs because the angle of the trachea on the right side of the lungs is much less acute. So if you are shoving that endotracheal tube in too far, it wants to go down that right bronchus. So selective intubation for up to about 48 hours has been suggested as well. Once you actually have the diagnosis of PIE, it's really important to get serial x-rays to see that progression. Hopefully, you're hoping that that PIE is going to go away. But also, like we said, these babies are at increased risk of developing a pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum and everything. And you do want to follow the x-rays to make sure that that doesn't end up happening. Generally, PIE lasts a few days to a few weeks. In some very rare cases, the PIE just kind of persists for ages. And even as it's healing, it, that whole area becomes really scarred. And in very rare cases, surgeons have to go in and do like a partial lobectomy and get rid of that area of the lungs that's completely useless. But generally, with gentle ventilation and good nutrition, that PIE will heal within a few days. And six, let's talk about the prognosis of PIE briefly. As you've all kind of put together, having PIE at all makes everything worse. It increases the risk of mortality. It increases your risk of developing BPD, which is pretty logical given all the fibrosis and scarring that can happen in the alveolar walls. And then obviously if that PIE ends up progressing into a pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum or whatever else, then that in itself is going to increase the morbidity and increase the risk of BPD and IVH and everything in babies. So really, we need to try to avoid PIE and be unbelievably gentle when we do see it. Okay, I hope you learned something. Thanks again to the member for suggesting this video. It was a very good idea. If you're interested in further neonatal education, then please subscribe to our channel. Thanks again so much for being here.